and co-found Ovio. Ovio is developing a platform making it easier for developers to contribute to open source. And in parallel, parallel, they are helping social impact projects go open source and are working with the US government, the UN World Food Program and others. So we welcome Eric and Amit to um, their session. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carol. I hope you can hear me okay. Yep, all that in kit. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amit Wadwa. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Eric Boucher. Um, I am a global program manager for the PRISM project at the UN World Food Program. I will tell you a little bit about this project today, um, some of the rationale behind going open source and what we're really trying to achieve with it. So I'll uh, go through a few slides first, and then I'll hand it over to Eric, who can also introduce himself a bit more. Good. So uh, uh, these are the types of images we're all seeing more and more these days of extreme weather events, droughts, cyclones, uh, all sorts of tropical storms and floods. They're increasing as the, the planet warms, and it's something that uh, the urgency of action is always increasing. And these types of disasters disproportionately affect poor populations. And uh, this is something that the World Food Program is actively working to address in terms of both direct interventions and technical assistance to our government partners on disaster risk reduction. Um, so Earth observation data, data coming from satellite imagery and other remotely sent sources provides a pretty clear opportunity to more actively monitor these types of hazards. Uh, but there are some challenges with working with this type of data. Um, so key amongst those is the technical skills that are required to access Earth observation data, to utilize it, and to bring it into systems. Um, second is the challenge that uh, low and middle income countries have limited resources, so don't necessarily have the opportunities to, to work with this type of information. And another challenge that we face in uh, implementing interventions is that who we target is really dependent not just on the hazard, but also on defining who is vulnerable. And the data on risk and vulnerability are often spread across different systems. So with these challenges, there are opportunities. Um, as I mentioned briefly, a key component of VFP's work is technical assistance to governments, um, and that includes on disaster risk reduction. Second is the opportunity that uh, by bringing vulnerability information into a climate risk analysis, we can improve our overall geographic targeting, meaning that we can prioritize those who are most in need of assistance. And then finally, this uh, gives the opportunity to produce faster uh, access to information, which means earlier responses and ideally less impact. So with those uh, challenges in mind, we have uh, developed a project which is called PRISM, the Platform for Real-Time Information and Situation Monitoring, and it has a few key objectives. So amongst those are one to unlock that uh, data access problem that we talked about. So really simplifying how climate hazard information can get to end users in, in, um, in, in lower resource settings. Second is to combine all these different types of information on hazard vulnerability and exposure in a single system so that we can more rapidly conduct analyses. Um, third, and this is something that kind of evolved over time as we we're working on implementation of the project, is to enhance the information that's coming from remotely sent sources with data on the ground. Um, and part of that includes data that's coming from mobile data collection tools like ODK, and also data coming from uh, ground sensors or weather stations that are implemented by the meteorological departments. Then more forward looking, what, one of the things that we're trying to address is how can we inform anticipatory actions? So really providing uh, information products before disaster actually strikes so that there's uh, actions that can come in as a preventative measure. And then also there's a term called shock responsive social protection, which basically means for uh, existing social assistance programs, how can they scale up uh, during times of disasters? And so we're also trying to see how we can inform those programs. Uh, and then finally, one of the key objectives was really to empower governments with an easy to configure and maintain technology solution, which is a big part of the push for open source. So just to quickly show you what the platform uh, looks like, 
Um, this is going to go a bit quickly here. So this is a, a demonstration from our uh, platform in Myanmar. I'm going to back up for one second. So here we have a series of hazard layers that are being brought into the system. These are coming from our Open Data Cube instance, which uh, is another thing that we're quite excited about, but not the focus of this talk. Um, and so as you toggle on a, a layer from uh, our Open Data Cube instance, it comes in through a WMS. Uh, you get the nice visualization, uh, but then in addition, we can do an analysis. This is a basic spatial analysis, which combines that um, raster data set with the vector data set on vulnerability. You can provide it some threshold, threshold information, a date parameter, and then you get a response as a tabular data on um, zonal statistics by administrative area on that raster, plus what we know about vulnerability. And you also get that in map form. And so this is really kind of leading towards that geographic prioritization for any types of intervention that we might have. Um, recently, we've also started to integrate uh, different types of hazard data, including those that are based upon vectors. This is a tropical storm layer that's coming into PRISM. Um, and here we can also do what's called an exposure analysis. So we're looking at a population raster data set from WorldPOP, combine that with the path of the storm to then look at where is the distribution of population potentially affected by the storm. Um, and then that can also be exposed as a table view as well. So that's a very, very quick overview of what the platform looks like. And now I'm going to hand it over to Eric to talk a little bit about the technology sec. Over to you, Eric. Thanks, Amit. So yeah, we've decided to build Prism open source for multiple reasons. Um, one of them is that we're leveraging, as you can see here, and I'll dive a tiny bit in, in the details, but we're leveraging a lot of existing open source tools. So it was important for us as we're building on open source to also contribute back uh, and share what we're building. Uh, but it was also important uh, for the collaboration that we want to create and invite uh, people from you know, multiple um, organizations that are facing similar problems to, to collaborate with us and, and build um, tools like this uh, together um, as well as building trust within government and you know having the code open is a way to also like show exactly what we're doing and uh, let governments like inspect uh, what, what's happening behind the scene or also adapt it to to their specific use case um, so on the data services side as i mentioned like we're leveraging you know a lot of like open open source uh, projects so that, such as jida like open data cube uh, geo server um, and like the the open standard that, that come with it um, on the API side you know it's a pretty standard uh, Python and, and flask application that helps us to do um, analysis and also um, interaction like if we need uh, between between the different services and on the front end we've uh, opted for a simple react um, application written in, in typescript and uh, we're using mapbox uh, right now on on the map side, uh, with the caveat that Mapbox, as of recently, is no longer open source. So we're like on their last open source version. Um, and this is something we'll, we, have, we are planning to change in the future uh, to make sure that our app remains sustainable and, and fully open source. So Prism is uh, on GitHub as an, under an MIT license and already has 14 contributors. So we've really decided to build Prism as a flexible tool, uh, which means that we've like split the different parts of uh, Prism under uh, a modular approach with the front end very uh, separate from the geospatial API, API written in Python that we showed. And then we have an, we're have we also building an alerting system. And they're all like very separate. So Prism, when we talk about, about it, is you know an ensemble of these modules. Uh, but if somebody is interested in only grabbing one of those pieces, like they are totally able to do that. And some of our government partners, for example, are only using a front end. If they don't need, you know, analysis with heavy compute operations, they can just spin up a simple front end that can connect directly to multiple types of, of data sources and then help to, as I mentioned earlier, toggle layers on and off and run like basic analysis. Um, then if you need something with more uh, geospatial analysis capabilities, then you can like plug in the API or like deploy it, and you will be able to get very, you know, easily um, like mix in data, get aggregates at the zone level for, you know, a mix of like GeoJSON and, and raster data, 
Um, and this really helps accelerate uh, what we can do and augment like what we can do on the front end. But potentially somebody could just plug in into this API and leverage it to do their analysis on, on Jupyter notebooks faster. Um, and then finally, like we're building an alerting system, which is really to going back to what Amit was explaining earlier, like accelerate the, the proactivity that we have with this type of alerts and make sure that like anytime we have a new uh, data source that, that's coming in and new, new information that's coming in, it can uh, get analyzed and based on like different thresholds and triggers that users can set, uh, like, you know, warn them and, and tell them to like come back to, to Prism or like to another tool um, and analyze the situation further. So really like what uh, we've wanted to do with, with Prism as well in terms of like the, the, the key benefits um, and, and our like technology choices was to make the deployments as easy and, and cheap uh, as possible. So for example, like the geospatial API as mentioned is shared between different uh, country offices and, and different uh, organizations, you know, building a, a front end on top of Prism. And the deployments are like pretty cheap on, on, the, on the front end side and, and super easy, as well as the configuration, which doesn't require any, any coding skills. It's really like, you know, configuration as file, uh, which is super important for us so that uh, anybody can come in and, and start playing with the application, adapt it to, to their use case, to their data sources, um, and see and see what it could what it could become for them. And the application, and we're trying to do that even more, but is adaptable to local context. So both in terms of the data sources that you can you can put in there, but also uh, in terms of language. And so we're working on making the app like more and more um, language specific. So in the video I made sure like you already saw um, that the, the table data that, that you get back is uh, adapted to uh, the country specific language. And finally, like going back uh, to the, the module approach that we took, it, it's uh, all about like collaboration ultimately and making sure that people can build in their own plugins and, and modules and really like uh, work together with the different uh, entities using the product so that we can um, like adapted to to our use case, but also like anytime you adapt, what you're really doing is like adding a block that other people can take and and build upon um, the next time. So like if you add a new data sources, uh, then you know other countries will be able to to leverage that in the future, and that's like really important in our in our mindset for um, how we want to build Prism long term. So. These are a set of, uh, I guess, like best practices that we, we've put in place uh, for, for Prism that we think uh, are important to share, but also like can be leveraged for, for other projects. Um, so, you know, nothing magical here, but uh, good, good things to, to keep in mind when, you, when you're starting a project like that with the goal of having it fully open source, but also have, you know, teams from multiple countries in multiple um, locations and time zones work, work uh, together. So on the project man management side, we've opted for GitHub and really having detailed GitHub issues so that everybody is up to date on you know, what the priorities are and uh, what everyone is, is working on. And then when needed, like we have a, a Slack group for, for synchronous communication. Um, on the coding side, we recommend having a really strong continuous integration and continuous deployment processes with like, you know, uh, QA gates along the way. And what we do is we try and have, you know, enforce like a, at least one reviewer per PR. So it might mean that sometimes PR like get merged a bit, a bit slower, but it's super important to make sure people uh, agree with what's been worked on like in, in other parts of, of the code. Um, and the modular code here really helps avoiding merge conflicts when people are working on different features um, and different parts of the application. So configuration as files, as I mentioned earlier, uh, super important. We actually tried in the early days having a configuration um, as a branch, uh, but that became really complicated really quickly. And it was hard to, to um, you know, share, share the knowledge between the different uh, deployments. And, and so this uh, has proven to be like a much more efficient approach. And finally, as we mentioned, the, the project accepts many data sources. And that's important for us to understand like, you know, what is WFP specific and make sure that we 
don't have uh, too too many um, yeah specific like sources or or branding or whatever. So right now, like we've tried as much as possible to um, make the application usable by any other organization that that would be interested. There is a slight WFP branding, but as a, again, the code is fully open source, so um, it would be easy, easy to change. And on the local you know, development, it's super easy. You can set it up in just a few minutes uh, after forking the, the GitHub repo. You're on mute, Amit. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just dive back in and give you some updates on the project, where we are, where we're going next. Uh, so the project did start in Asia, so we've uh, deployed it in four countries in Asia as of uh, present, and we've got quite a few additional ones in the pipeline. Um, the project did evolve from uh, being developed in Indonesia and Cambodia to our regional office in, in Bangkok, and now we've shifted it to our global headquarters in Rome. Um, and from there, we're overseeing deployments in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the Middle East is coming up as well, and we've had a number of discussions also for Latin America. So uh, quite a bit of new work coming, and with that, uh, a, a lot of more challenges for us to get through, but um, yeah, I'm quite excited about the collaboration going forward. Um, in terms of like overall growth and impact, as I mentioned, we, we did grow up from local offices to regional, now ready to scale up globally. Um, we rebuilt the technology stack, as Eric has described to you, with a big focus on interoperability and a very lightweight front end that can be rapidly deployed. Um, and as I briefly mentioned before, we've also really um, been leveraging an Open Data Cube instance. This is uh, an instance that's managed by WFP out of our headquarters, and it pulls together the years of work we've done on Earth observation for food security monitoring and putting that into a very scalable uh, cloud-based infrastructure. Um, and so that's quite exciting for us, and we're actually pushing towards having that as an open resource for all humanitarian agencies, um, NGOs, etc. And that's something hopefully in a future phosphory talk we can get into more details. Um, in terms of the impact and how this system has been used, last year there was some pretty significant flooding in Cambodia in October. and. Uh, through a partnership that we had with uh, NASA to produce some real-time flood analytics that was then integrated into PRISM, uh, we were able to identify very rapidly um, nearly 800,000 people who were affected by the floods. And through that and combining it with, with the vulnerability information, we were able to um, specifically uh, uh, come up with figures on the number of people who would require assistance, nearly a quarter million, which ultimately led to uh, funding from USAID to then provide uh, flood uh, relief. So this was a really interesting use case of how um, the partnership side and the open source technology all came together to provide um, assistance in a, in a real emergency. Uh, in terms of what's coming up next, we've got a handful of features that we're really focused on. Um, one is the ability to generate automated risk and impact reports. So uh, we talked about that alert mechanism very briefly. So you can set up a threshold, and if that threshold is exceeded, uh, get an email. Uh, beyond that, we also want to just generate automated reports so that um, that can be circulated without even having to go into the system. Um, second, we're working much more on the mobile data integration side. We've got a, a framework to do this, but we're going deeper, especially with ODK and Kobo toolbox forms to um, make this something that can be very easily and rapidly configured to show in PRISM. Um, we're working on more full support for liquidation. We do have some basic components of this, but we're looking to really further build this out. And in terms of other things that we're working towards with the overall project and the work that's related to it at WFP, uh, we're working on a data extraction process from Open Data Cube that will more seamlessly bring in um, things like time series data into PRISM to do some more robust analytics. Uh, related to that, we're working on a stack implementation and integrating stack uh, more directly with uh, Open, sorry, with, uh, with PRISM. And then finally, um, you know, as Eric mentioned, we want to make sure that this is getting reused beyond just WFP. And so we're pushing towards getting uh, recognized as a digital public good alliance um, project. We're already part of the registry, but we're moving to the next stage of that, which is really kind of being a recommended product that could be used by other actors. 
Um, yeah, I think that's basically it. So, you know, we really uh, we're excited about presenting this at Phosphor-G because of, um, you know, the skill sets and uh, aligned objectives that a lot of us have. So this is a project that's very open for collaboration. Um, OVO actually has a project website for us and OVO is, uh, you know, focused on pairing skilled volunteers with um, social impact projects. So uh, you can find more about how we work with OVO on this project website and the different skills that we're looking for currently. Uh, the repo is on GitHub, uh, openly accessible, and you can also reach us by email. Um, good, I think that was it for the presentation and uh, we're ready for any questions. Thanks. Thanks so much. Mm, I seem to have lost audio here. Okay. Carol, can you hear me? I can hear you. I mean, but I can't hear Carol. Ah, that's Carol then. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm going to look over at the questions that I can see. Uh, I see a question about what data sources are you using Open Data Cube to analyze and maintain? Um, so our Open Data Cube instance right now is using uh, two core uh, information sources. We're using the Chirps data set, so from UC Santa Barbara, uh, global precipitation data set. And from that, we derive um, maybe around seven or eight different uh, rainfall related indicators. So things like uh, current amount of precipitation, uh, precipitation anomalies, and we're also um, looking at dry spells and uh, uh, rain streaks as well. Um, so that's one component. And then the other is uh, MODIS. So from MODIS, we're deriving uh, land, surface, land surface temperature as well as an NDVI product. And we're doing those globally at five kilometer um, and then specific countries, we're doing them at one kilometer and uh, in the pipelines to do that at 250 meter resolution and make that available to our data cube. Carol, are you, are you back? <laughs> no. Okay, I still can't hear Carol. Okay. Um, next, okay. I think that seems to be the only question for us as of now. Do you see any of the questions, Eric? Actually, I see zero question on my end, so. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, I see just a comment from Haley. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Haley. And it would be great to hear from you if you're interested in collaboration. Um, good. If there's not any other questions, Eric, anything else you wanted to add before uh, we conclude? No, I think that's it. But yeah, like if anybody's interested in helping on the project or, or partnering in any way, like, yeah, please have a look at, uh, at Prism and yeah, send us an email and contact us. Okay. Carol, are you back now? I see the video moving. <laughs> Maybe not. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, it seems like Carol's having some connection problems. All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it from us. Uh, Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone, for attending, and uh, hope to hear from you on potential collaboration in the future. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.